Hello and welcome. I'm Real Crowd CEO Adam Hooper, and this is the Real Estate Investing for Your Future podcast. Here we explore the latest in commercial real estate trends, insights, and investment strategies that passive investors can use to build real estate portfolios that last. All opinions expressed by Adam, Tyler, and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Real Crowd. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. To gain a better understanding of the risks associated with commercial real estate investing, please consult your advisors. Welcome to another episode of a special series we recorded with our friends from the Urban Land Institute. This series is brought to you live from ULI's fall meeting in Dallas that featured over 45 sessions, 150 speakers, 240 events, and more than 5,500 members in attendance. In today's conversation, we're joined by a truly all-star cast with Paul Angelone and Timothy Moore from ULI, Colm Clark from the George W. Bush Institute, and finally, Craig Leibowitz, Eric Foster, and Carl Questenberry of Avis & Young. Our first interview is with Paul Angelone, Senior Director at ULI's Curtis Infrastructure Initiative, to discuss highlights from his panel at the fall meeting on how to prioritize effective infrastructure-led development. The ULI Curtis Infrastructure Initiative identifies and promotes forward-looking infrastructure investments that are equitable, resilient, and that enhance long-term community value. To learn more about Paul, the fall meeting, and the ULI's Curtis Infrastructure Initiative, be sure to check the show notes. With that, let's get to the conversation. Paul, thank you so much for taking some time here at the fall meeting to share with us. Uh, we just watched your panel. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do with ULI and, and what you just covered on your panel? Well, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here, but uh, I work for the Urban Land Institute as the Senior Director for Infrastructure. And what I really focus on is the intersection between infrastructure, land use, and real estate. And at the Curtis Infrastructure Initiative, we're really um, trying to create a more equitable, resilient, healthy cities that build both uh, uh, community value as well as uh, real estate value as part mm -hmm. of this process. And so your panel was about infrastructure-led development. Um, high level, what is infrastructure? Well, it's a little complicated. Uh, yeah. We, uh, when we started this initiative about uh, two years ago, we asked the very same question. So we uh, sent a survey to about 400 ULI members, which mm -hmm. is a good representative uh, representation of ULI membership. And it really, there wasn't a consensus around it. Mm -hmm. And so, but people thought of it really as um, a foundation to society, uh, uh, opportunity um, really frames what development is. But we typically work in areas anywhere from transportation, about moving people and things, uh, to communications like broadband, mm -hmm. uh, thinking about uh, utilities such as energy or water, and finally really those places that, that build communities, so whether that's schools, mm -hmm. um, parks, uh, and other open spaces. And so how intertwined are real estate and infrastructure? I mean, they're, they're, one is the other and the other is, I mean, they're, they're pretty well intertwined, right? Exactly. Um, one of the areas that really drive um, real estate development is both the quality of the infrastructure mm -hmm. and, of course, the regulatory policies that are around that. So mm -hmm. without really high quality um, uh, infrastructure, um, as well as good policies around it, uh, uh, the, what happens as well as market demand yeah. um, is uh, what really drives a lot of real estate investment. Um, and depending on the type of infrastructure, um, you will have different types of development, whether it's uh, you know sprawl um, to or more uh, compact, uh, walkable communities. Yeah, and I definitely want to dig into that a little bit out of this you know kind of a post-COVID world, right? What's maybe changed about the view towards infrastructure? Uh, before we get to that, though, um, you mentioned the panel. There's a lot of new regulatory incentives and, and capital coming into infrastructure development. So for developers and real estate managers that are looking at new projects, how should they be thinking about this, this kind of renewed emphasis on infrastructure and how can they learn maybe how to participate in some of that incentive for, for infrastructure development? Well, we are having the most amount of uh, infrastructure investment since the creation of the highway interstate system in the 1950s. So there's a tremendous amount of dollars that are coming um, mm -hmm. into uh, the marketplace. And so capital is less of a challenge mm -hmm. now, um, but it really is about how that 
money is being allocated. A lot of those from the federal government is going from uh, directly to the states, uh, to regional uh, uh, decision bodies, mm -hmm. uh, as well as local jurisdictions. And so the real estate developers should be a part of the conversations that's, that those communities are having mm -hmm. um, to really help drive uh, where that infrastructure development will happen. Because um, with, you know, a lot of these things will take a long time. I mean, mm -hmm. these dollars will come over the next five years or so. Um, but... Um, what these decisions that are being made right now will really drive where real estate will be happening, mm -hmm. uh, re where real estate development will be happening for the next 10 to 15 years. And so is it, and I guess I'm thinking like, is it, is it chicken or the egg thing, right? Does, does infrastructure drive what's built or does what wants to get built drive what infrastructure gets created, right? H how do those interact with one another and which, which drives which? It's it's a little bit. It definitely is a chicken of the egg about yeah. where where things are happening. But I think um, public bodies have a real opportunity to actually frame where infrastructure happens. So mm -hmm. whether it's um, thinking about are you investing in, in transit, whether it whether it's heavy rail or uh, BRT, which is bus rapid transit, or mm -hmm. other type of uh, movable, um, um, or thinking about uh, highway expansions in other uh, areas. And so um, that which allow you to go further um, out with development. So mm -hmm. the types of uh, infrastructure will determine where things go. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that also uh, you know, the COVID really did drive a lot of, um, accelerated a lot of trends mm -hmm. uh, with what things are happening. And so, you know, but infrastructure is something that, you know, will happen over the next 10 uh, years or so mm -hmm. as it's being invested in. Um, so, you know, we have a real opportunity to shape where that's going. And mm -hmm. so, you know, having real estate developers uh, in the conversation who actually will be putting up some of the money to actually finance and fund this because mm -hmm. there's tremendous amount of federal dollars that are coming. But uh, historically, about 70 percent of that funding comes from the, uh, the state, local jurisdictions and then developers themselves. In the private sector, yeah. So I guess the the converse of that when you're looking at it may be infrastructure that's degrading or getting a little bit more tired over the years. Mm -hmm. um, does that does that precipitate decline in real estate value or does the decline in real estate value lead to infrastructure being neglected? Again, it's I'm probably similar similar to the, the growth of that, a bit of a chicken or the egg. And then how does that how does that look going forward as communities try to maintain or improve that infrastructure? How 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 does that all come together? Well, I think one a lot of this money that's coming out is really focused on the capital um, capital uh, expenses to be able to build that infrastructure itself, mm -hmm. and doesn't really address a lot of the um, maintenance that's required for mm -hmm. this. And so there were provisions that were part of this federal legislation that didn't get included that were about uh, trying to uh, fix it first. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so a lot of this money could go to new investment, uh, new new roadways, or new uh, water systems, or new new places. And so, um, you know, the real estate development uh, will pay the property taxes um, or other, you know, revenue sources to actually fund that maintenance over the years. And mm -hmm. so the quality of development and the quality of real estate are really important mm -hmm. to make sure that you have, you know, dense enough tracks or spaces that actually can pay for the service that are required. And mm -hmm. so making sure that you have a mix of different type of uses, a mix of real estate um, um, the types of things that ULI members are really advocating for and, and really doing and the type of developments that they're doing are, are really, uh, you know, real opportunities to showcase uh, uh, example, best case examples that will ultimately pay for um, the infrastructure that's being built today um, over the next uh, 10 to 15 uh, to 50 years, to be mm -hmm. honest. And then now getting to the, the changes and accelerants that we saw during COVID, I, I, I think we've explored that a lot on the podcast and conversations of some things were just fundamental changes to how we interact with built environment and others were accelerants of trends that were already in place. So we explore that a little bit. What have you seen that's been an accelerant of a change that was maybe already underway and this has just caused it to happen in two or three years rather than eight to 10 years? Um, and then what are some of the more truly fundamental changes that you've seen coming out of the, the environment that we just went through? One of the biggest, I think, accelerations that, that I've seen has really been remote working mm -hmm. um, and how that uh, has impacted how people are commuting or moving around spaces. So there's a lot of people that still have to commute, mm -hmm. but typically those are um, 
uh, uh, lower income uh, or or in jobs that require you to be there. Like, for instance, I'm in Washington, D.C. There's a lot of national security people. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to be um, in their office, whereas um, I'm lucky not to have to be in my office every day. Um, and so uh, where, you know, there's high quality broadband Internet um, uh, will really drive where some of that um, where places where people could be remote mm -hmm. or, or located. And so the, the quality of that infrastructure will be really important. I think you're also seeing, um, you know, a lot more uh, s services that you typically would go to the doctor for um, that you can do virtually mm -hmm. um, or thinking about um, how you, you access an Uber or Lyft or other type of uh, ride share um, mobility as a service. Mm -hmm. um, you access that that's uh, having higher quality uh, broadband or other type of Internet connections will really kind of allow those types of things to happen mm -hmm. uh, more often. Um, but I think uh, those commuting patterns, I think, really will be the, the big driver. And, and, and my hope is, is that we're able to uh, uh, create more, um, you know, mixed income, uh, mixed uh, uh, uses of locations, mm -hmm. um, which will have, you know, um, you know, to help, you know, bring in more residential into downtown areas. Um, you know, think about uh, in suburban offices, uh, more residential in those areas, too, mm -hmm. that you can really create opportunities and those are the types of neighborhoods that are actually seeing you know offices uh you know still have uh, uh less vacancy mm -hmm. and, and other uh, kind of the neighbors are more dynamic yeah and then when we think about what's next for infrastructure looking forward i mean we've been talking about self-driving cars for ever right mm -hmm. um when we look at maybe where the u.s is a very car-centric uh culture right from infrastructure perspective so maybe some with ULI being a global organization, um, other countries are maybe a little bit more advanced in terms of rapid transit, trains, high speed, stuff like that. Where do you see maybe the next 10, 15 years of infrastructure for us? And then where do you see us on the global spectrum of, of our, uh, I guess, advanced placement or advanced thinking towards infrastructure? The automobile was the last major disruptor um, mm -hmm. of urban areas. And so those real estate areas that are most successful are those areas that have been able to uh, reorient it towards people. Mm -hmm. um, and because uh, real estate fundamentally is about people um, and then the experiences that are created within that. And mm -hmm. so cars are a part of that, but aren't the full uh, side of it. So I think you are going to see a lot more technology um, as part of ro uh, both roadway safety um, and cars. I don't know if we're ever going to get to um, uh, fully autonomous cars, mm -hmm. but I do think that you're going to see a lot more, um, you know, virtual track and other type of uh, 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 mobility opportunities, whether it's uh, on, on that and then there's opportunities with that. But I think that... Um, really you know it's thinking about like how actually really do people walk around and actually move in that that space that's designed and the experience is really where the real estate industry can help define that because mm -hmm. um instead of doing you know peak of the peak commute you're really thinking about um how people move around and transportation as a social um, mm -hmm. opportunity so it's it's that conversation that i have with my daughter uh, biking her to school every day mm -hmm. it's not just getting point a to point b it's really doing lots of different services all day. So really having, where it's not, shouldn't just be about commuting, it's really about creating access for all the different types of things because mm -hmm. you know, uh, offices aren't the only thing that you go to. We also do a lot of other activities. And I guess there's, there's different senses of scale when you're talking about infrastructure, right? There's what is that walk from your office to the coffee shop or something mm -hmm. or from your house to school. And then there is intrastate transportation and, and again, just the different senses of scale and I guess, um, you know, how should a real estate manager developer be thinking about that sense of scale, right? They might not be able to have an influence on whether or not a high-speed rail comes to the West Coast, right? But they maybe have more control over a local development. So I guess maybe where where can real estate operators, developers be thinking about those scales and, and how can they learn more maybe about um, how to influence that infrastructure around their developments? I, yeah, uh, development is, is very hyper-local, particularly mm -hmm. when you're doing a lot of infill type of development. Um, um, uh, and it's really about how do you connect into those services, um, mm -hmm. uh, particularly as developers at a, at a larger scale will build a lot of that infrastructure as part of that, both mm -hmm. on-site and off-site because they can control um, that development. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, all infrastructure development, real estate development, others, really making sure that it's a partnership between 
uh, the public sector, mm -hmm. um, the private sector, uh, community members and others, and really having those conversations because uh, that's really going to uh, develop relationships and opportunities to start making changes and addressing some of those mm -hmm. bigger concerns. And and um, I started off that presentation talking about Jim Curtis, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, funded uh, my initiative at, at the initiative that I work at at Urban Land Institute. And he really, uh, what he did was, you know, the, the District of Columbia was in federal receivership at the time, mm -hmm. um, really worked with private developers to come to, um, came to the district, came to the federal government, uh, the regional transit agency, to actually, to build an infill transit station that then has created um, billions of dollars of real estate development mm -hmm. around uh, that opportunity. So even uh, understanding that, um, e while you focus on the, the individual kind of parcel level, um, that parcel level really does influence the broader systems. And so this is, mm -hmm. you know, thinking about how do we interconnect all of these different systems and create uh, more of a holistic, uh, people-centric mm -hmm. environment. So what, uh, what has you most excited about the future of infrastructure? <clears throat> The thing I'm most excited about is really thinking about how do you start aligning up a lot of the capital investment mm -hmm. uh, within uh, both from the private sector as well as the public sector, along with real estate developers and making sure that all those different portfolios are working together. Mm -hmm. So making sure that um, when one side of the house might be investing in something, the other it isn't uh, adversely impacting the, mm -hmm. uh, the other side of the house. And mm -hmm. so if, you know, even, you know, large institutional partners can work together to actually uh, better fund and finance infrastructure, um, as well as also uh, do better real estate development. I think you're going to start seeing better opportunities there. And uh, we're going to create a lot of community value. We're also going to create a lot of real estate value as part of that process. And so how, how does that come about? Is that collaboration just at a, at a local level? Is that where does ULI take a position in, in kind of building some of that collaboration? How, how does how, how do listeners of this this conversation, how can they start, <clears throat> excuse me, how can they start getting involved in uh, working together to, to get some of those better outcomes? We'd love to have you involved in our uh, organization. <laughs> uh, I, I'm happy to uh, provide my, you know, my web, uh, the website, uh, uli.org backslash yeah. infrastructure. If there's ways to contact me and talk about this. But I think broadly, it's really a, about um, uh, organizations like ULI that mm -hmm. really break down a lot of these silos. We've really mm -hmm. siloed ourselves off in a lot of different areas and having these cross uh, collaborative uh, discussions really will start helping to break that down mm -hmm. um, because we're not just engineers, we're not just developers, we're not just uh, financiers, we're really everyone together yeah. and thinking, working together and having those conversations will start getting those better outcomes. Perfect, well Paul, I think that's a, a great spot to end it. You gave a little preview there of how people can connect with you. Let, them, let us know again how they can uh, get in touch with you and learn more about what you're up to with ULI. Yep. Uh, feel free to email me at PA, uh, Paul Angelone uh, at uli.org or um, contact me at uh, uli.org backslash infrastructure. Thank you again to Paul for taking the time to join us. Next up is Colm Clark. Colm is a director at the George W. Bush Institute and an adjunct professor of economics at SMU. In this interview, Colum shares with us his thoughts on the building blocks that create thriving local economies, and he shares insights from his panel at the fall meeting called The Texas Miracle, How Do We Get Here and What's Next for Dallas-Fort Worth? We hope you enjoy the conversation with Colum Clark. All right, Colum, thank you so much for coming to spend a few minutes with us here uh, at the fall meeting. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the work that you do uh, with the George W. Bush Institute sure. and it's, SMU. It's great to be with you. Thanks for having me. So I'm an economist uh, working at the George W. Bush Institute and SMU. Uh, I lead the domestic economic policy work of the Bush Institute, mm -hmm. and I, I focus really heavily on uh, really the challenge of creating prosperous, inclusive, high-opportunity places, regions, cities, towns, and neighborhoods. And I think that's very much uh, kind of uh, top of mind mm -hmm. at this ULI event. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I also uh, teach a class. I'm an adjunct professor at SMU. I teach undergraduates. Great. And so are you looking at, it sounds like you're looking at uh, scales down to local neighborhoods all the way up to 
municipalities to cities. Is that very much and metropolitan, and metropolitan areas, areas as yeah. well? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, I, I basically argue that the the principles for building prosperous, high opportunity places are are kind of what we would call scale invariant. Uh, it's they're they're not so different at the level of mm-hmm. a small part of a city as a great big metropolitan area like the Dallas Fort Worth area. Perfect. Well, that's a good segue into your panel today, mm-hmm. uh, titled "The Texas Miracle: How Do We Get Here and What's Next for DFW." So. Tell us a little bit about the first the panel who was on it, some of the conversations you had there. Sure, we had a really a terrific conversation. Uh, I was uh, visiting with uh, Ron Kirk, who was former mayor of Dallas, in mm-hmm. fact the first black mayor in our city's history, uh, and a former uh, U.S. trade representative under President Obama. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we had Michael Levy, who was the CEO of Crow Holdings. Mm-hmm. Dallas-based company, one of the biggest real estate investment and development firms in the world. Uh, And uh, uh, we were uh, a little bit sad because we were also going to be joined. First, we had in mind, uh, we we, we had the current mayor of Fort Worth. Mm -hmm. She couldn't make it. Then we had the immediate past mayor of Fort Worth who got sick this morning. Oh, no. And so we kind of had to pivot. Uh, And Fort Worth has a great story to tell. So we tried to to do a little bit of justice to it all the same. But it was a great discussion. Good. Well, so the point of the the panel was basically how did we get to where we are here in the the Dallas metro area? Yes. Um, Tell us a little bit about the the history history of the area and, and what's led to this recent boom of growth? Well, it's really been quite a transformation. It's been amazing to uh, to be a part of. I was born and raised here, and, mm-hmm. and, and sometimes the, the kind of the story is personal. Like I had grandparents and uncles and aunts and parents who've been in, mm-hmm. involved in it. Um, you know, I guess I would, uh, let, let's start with what Ron Kirk said, because he's, let's, he was the mayor. Let's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, he's got a lot to say about it. Um, he, uh, pointed out that, you know, the city is, it's not by a natural port or a navigable river uh, or any particularly significant uh, natural features Mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, sources of natural resources or anything. Um, So it really uh, came to exist or at least got kind of got going because it it was at the junction of two railroads. Mm -hmm. And in fact, even the path of the north-south railroad uh, was uh, actually originally going to go somewhere else. And he, he basically told the story of how one particular politician from Dallas managed to redirect the, mm-hmm. the plan. So uh, so Dallas really came into being uh, as a transportation hub. Okay. And then uh, you fast forward 100 years, roughly, and they the, the essentially the city leaders of Dallas and Fort Worth, who didn't always have a great history of getting along, mm-hmm. managed to come together and, uh, and and create the Dallas Fort Worth Airport, one of the biggest, okay. uh, uh, busiest airports in the world. Uh, so essentially, we doubled down on our role as a transportation hub, and subsequently became the nation's leading inland port, uh, an alliance airport. We have the nation's leading uh, pure cargo uh, airport. Um, and along that way, finance and a lot of other things grew up. So it's been kind of a, uh, a you know, very much a history, uh, excuse me, it's a, it's, a, it's a metropolitan area built by commerce, mm-hmm. built around trade and goods and services and so forth. Uh, and, uh, and it's been a great success story, notwithstanding some challenges. And seems like there's been, again, a push uh, in the more recent history. Obviously, that's going quite back to the, the founding of you know, the early origins of the area. Um, what's led to this kind of current wave of, of growth that Dallas has seen? Yeah, because there are plenty of other places that are, are transportation hubs, yeah. obviously. So something's gone really, really right, and that was really the, the, the kind of the heart of the discussion. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think that if you put, it, put together what everyone had to say, including my own work uh, at, the, at the Bush Institute, um, I, I, I think what I would say is we, we don't have – it's not some one magic bullet. There's mm-hmm. not the single thing that made all the difference. Uh, there's a, a kind of portfolio of assets that when you add them up have turned out to have a very powerful effect. Mm -hmm. Uh, One asset is being a place that has been, particularly in the wider metropolitan area, an unusually friendly place to do business Mm -hmm. and to build new housing, which has kept a significant cost of the cost of doing business Mm -hmm. advantage and perhaps even more important, a cost of living advantage over a lot of rivals elsewhere in the United States. So that this idea of delivering quality of life at an affordable price point, Mm -hmm. I think, has been really, really important. We've we've generally operated a pretty business or commerce friendly uh, policy framework compared Mm -hmm. to a number of places, particularly places on the coast uh, that have, uh, if anything, uh, been getting progressively more hostile to business, as Michael Levy said. And Michael uh, really uh, emphasized again and again, uh, capital is mobile. Businesses 
don't want to uh, be where they're not treated well. Right. Capital goes where it can earn a, earn a return, and uh, uh, th this has been a great region for capital to, to earn a return. So mm -hmm. capital has flowed in, as have, uh, as have people. And so how, how can other area, I mean, is there, is there a template there that other municipalities can learn from and implement on a time scale that's, that's uh, I mean, it seems like that's a pretty large time scale to make some of those changes, right? If it's not foundationally set up in that fashion. Well, you know, I, mean, I think we have to define time scale. It's not possible to transform the economy, at least for the better. You may yeah. be able to mess it up in a really short period of time, <laughs> sure. but you certainly can't can't bring about a major turnaround and a, a big burst of prosperity in just a few months right. or two or three years. Um, uh, it's inevitably going to take somewhat longer, but I think there are um, things that um, that we've gotten right here in, in, in Texas mm -hmm. that uh, other places could imitate, probably with some pretty powerful, powerful effects over like a 10 to 20 year time frame, mm -hmm. which is really a time frame over which city leaders should be planning. Right. You know, if they only think about the next few months, they're right. not going to they're going to fall on their faces. Um, so. Uh, so, yeah, I think that uh, uh, cities have it in their power, for example, to, um, you know, reform zoning codes mm -hmm. and, and uh, permitting process and all this kind of sort of seemingly boring stuff that ultimately determines whether it is a good place to build new things, build right. new housing, build new other types of, uh, of real estate properties. Um, and uh, that's that's reformable. Yeah. And if places that manage to get that reasonably right uh, are typically, they, they, they get big building booms uh, and they, uh, uh, you know, assuming they have some other basic things going for them. Um, and uh, so that's, that's something that places can get right. Uh, you know, I think that... Um, uh, places are, are, they're all in a competition on quality of life grounds. Mm -hmm. So uh, another thing cities can do is just invest in quality of life amenities. Mm -hmm. I think that's, it's, it's, there's no great rocket science here. You look around the country, you just, just watch where the people are, right. where do they like to be? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, so, some cities are more fortunate than uh, Dallas in having a sort of more, let's say, lively river fronts or lake fronts. It's where mm -hmm. people like, you know, hanging out in parks by bodies of water, or right. beaches or whatever. So if you do that pretty well, people like interesting walkable downtowns that feel like they have some sense of authenticity to them. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, whether it be traditional downtowns or, let's say, new alternative downtowns that maybe have been built very recently. So uh, cities have it in their power to build things that people will like to, uh, to be a part of. Yeah. Uh, so that's, I think those are some formulas. And so all of that probably equates to, a, a, again, we've been talking about resiliency more in the climate hardening yes. of um, just the physical assets economic resiliency, right? We're, when all is good, all is great, right? Everything's going great. Um, heading into what seems to be a fairly uncertain economic time in front of us. Yep. How do all those different fabrics come together to create economic resiliency to get through those more challenging times? Yeah, I think uh, you I think you ask it right in terms of economic resiliency. One thing that uh, economists have shown is that um, diversity is good. Mm -hmm. Diversity of industries, diversity of people, um, uh, diversity is good, not just because, of course, diversity is a hedge against something going wrong in like one industry. Mm -hmm. It's bad to have nothing but the auto industry when the auto right. industry collapses, yeah. like in the Detroit area or something. Right. Um, it's frankly not all that great to be to have uh, nothing but uh, uh, you know high tech, because uh, mm -hmm. even though that creates great wealth, uh, it also uh, there's a pretty vast parts of the population that it really doesn't create yeah. opportunities for, which yeah. is why so many, one reason why so many people are leaving, say, the Bay, the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, like the other big metropolitan areas of Texas, uh, it's unusually diverse in its industrial makeup. Mm -hmm. And that means that it has a hedge against things going wrong in any one sector. Mm -hmm. And more than that, what economists have also shown is that when you have a diversity of industries, the industries, you know, disparate ideas bumping together and sort of reproducing, you know, procreating, producing new ideas, mm -hmm. new industries, uh, that is, in a sense, where innovation comes from. It's where productivity improvements come from. And so uh, innovation makes places more productive and creative mm -hmm. and innovative. And we've had that going for us here. Good. And now taking that sense of scale back down to maybe uh, a property owner or developer, right. what are some of the, the learnings? And I guess maybe, A, how can, they, how can they learn about what's happened here and what's kind of created this? And how can they have some agency or effect at their more local, regional level when they're, you know, they're, they're a property developer in a local market? 
well, we've, we have so many great developer success stories in the Dallas area, it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, so I'm certainly not an expert on how to develop any one type of property, but mm -hmm. when I look around, you can see what's succeeding. Mm -hmm. So for example, one thing that's definitely succeeding is um, what I previously called kind of alternative downtowns. So mm -hmm. kind of walkable, mixed use nodes Typically, these days, in suburban areas, but it doesn't have to be. It could be a redevelopment within mm -hmm. a core city. Um, uh, but places that uh, kind of bring a lot of things together in relatively close proximity so that people can kind of live, work, play. Not everybody wants to you know, mm -hmm. live within walking distance of, let's say, a big job center. But a decent number of people do. And that makes the whole place more lively. So that's, that's something developer. Can I, can I mention one other yeah, thing? Yeah. That's something for sure we've done really well here. So, for example, um, the, uh, along uh, the, 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 the toll road, the, the Dallas North Toll Road yep. uh, in West Plano and Frisco has emerged as essentially a new downtown right. that is bigger now in terms of office square footage and people coming to work each day than the Dallas Central Business District. Interesting. And that's a creation of just the last 20 years, basically. Yeah. It's an incredible success. So, um, and there's lots of smaller nodes out there. Michael Levy talked about uh, just how important these different nodes mm -hmm. are, that that's kind of what the geography of the Dallas-Fort Worth looks, area looks like. Great success story. Another is building these big suburban master planned communities. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that just, it's its like they're growing like hotcakes, you know, just like one after the other, spreading further and further outwards in all directions. Where you provide all the amenities within yes. that within yes, that community. Yes, an amenitized yeah. master plan community that is mostly... Uh, typically single family homes, yeah. uh, although sometimes there are townhomes and other things. Yeah. Um, uh, but yes, with amenities within the, within the actual plan. And so how, kind of going back to what you mentioned before, those alternative downtowns, how do you create authenticity in a new project? That's, a, that's I think, a really interesting and perplexing question. Yeah. Uh, people like authenticity. There's no question, um, you know, uh, in uh, when traditional uh, downtowns, uh, like buildings with maybe good bones, as they say, mm -hmm. but actually, you know, where the, the original function for them has become obsolete, mm -hmm. um, when they get adaptively reused, that, those can be among the most popular kinds of real estate anywhere. Yeah. So when you start on a, what was formerly a hayfield, what, how do you, how do you achieve that, right? <laughs> um, you know, I think that creative developers and architects and so forth, when they're smart, uh, are trying to create something that while no one can claim it actually is authentically from some earlier period, that it nonetheless evokes Has that same some kind of, kind of yeah. it creates some sense that it's actually, you know, it's really trying to be a place, mm -hmm. like somewhere, uh, you know, not just anywhere. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, and I think there are a lot of success stories. I mean, I think in the North Texas area, I think that in uh, places like uh, Frisco and Allen and McKinney, mm -hmm. uh, you, you are in fact seeing, uh, while all of those, those kind of centers we're talking about are extremely new, mm -hmm. nonetheless, um, you know, in some cases, they're, they're, they, they do actually feel like a place, like a, an actual, you know, place in space, not yeah. just like endless suburbia. Right. That's fascinating. And I think that's... Um Definitely something that at, at that scale you can replicate independent of, I mean, zoning aside, right? I mean, there's probably some zoning issues around that that might have to be overcome. Yeah, and in fact, it's, qu it's quite hard in core cities to, to, to build on top of what is already there. Right. Uh, because when you're talking about what's already there, you're talking about densifying something that probably had pretty low density before. And mm -hmm. uh, the city of Dallas and other core cities around the United States have found that an extraordinarily hard thing to, to do. Yeah. Politically, very difficult. Okay. Well, uh, why don't you let, let the listeners know how uh, they can learn more about what you're up to with the Institute and SMU. Well, sure. Uh, so I've had the opportunity to, to write quite a number of things, and I'm oftentimes out speaking as well. Uh, uh, but in terms of our written work, it's on the George W. Bush Institute website. Uh, you can look up under Colin Clark, or you can look up under Blueprint for Economic Opportunity, and it's all there. Perfect. And we'll have links in the show notes for uh, everybody that wants to go check that out. So, Colm, thank you so much for spending your time with us. So terrific to be here. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Colm. Now we're going to hear from Tim Moore, manager at ULI for Boston and New England. In this interview, Tim dives into the risks and rewards of investing into opportunistic markets. And with that, here's Tim. Well, Tim, thanks for, for joining us today and tell us a little bit about the, the fall conference here uh, for ULI. Why don't you tell us about the work that you do with ULI? Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit more in depth. Awesome. Awesome. Well, great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Tim Moore. I'm manager at ULI Boston. Um, there I oversee programs and 
their technical assistance panels. So our technical assistance panels, we go into communities, municipalities, and help them solve complicated land use issues. Okay, so you're not necessarily working with private companies, or you're working with private companies and public entities, or typically municipalities. Okay. Um, so we offer the service at a very discounted rate, and since our members also provide the service, we try not to compete with them. So municipalities strictly most most of the time. Okay, and what are some of the challenges that you're helping solve? Oh man, it's uh. So we have a joke that nobody comes to us for like easy things. <laughs> so we have, I'm working on a bus electrification station and a land swap between the state and the city. Okay. Now we have to solve and get stakeholders there. And there's a, um, a conservancy that wants to reclaim some of the land back. So we get all these stakeholders to the table and figure out like what the best practice of this would be. Um, another one, we articulate a, a land swap and a rezoning. So that was people giving up their parcels of land essentially so we could decontaminate it and make bring it to its highest and best value okay so it could be repurposed so a lot of stuff like that so no no two days are going to be alike for you not not in terms <laughs> of tasks no um and so again i know a lot of your focus is on i think what you call opportunistic markets mm-hmm. um which are maybe more secondary tertiary markets so tell us a little bit about how, how would first off how would you define an opportunistic market so in layman's terms, opportunistic markets are risky. Um, I, I explain as a blade canvas. I'm going to, to communities, sometimes neighborhoods and cities, that have tons of potential, mm-hmm. but the average investor isn't going to, they're not trying to envision something. You mm-hmm. want a, a core play, like most people like core. Um, you put your money there, it makes a little bit of money. Some people like value add, where you're like, okay, I got to go in and change uh, washers and dryers and maybe mm-hmm. like change Spruce the facade. It up a little bit. Yeah. I go in and I'm like, okay, what does this piece of land look like and what's the potential of it? And then I convince people to buy into that vision. Okay. So it's, it's, I mean, are you mostly ground up developments? Is it repositionings? It sounds like, I mean, if you're doing land swaps and electrifications, I mean, you're all the way down to. It's all of it. Uh, the interesting thing is, so you, you have your, what exists in the neighborhood and you're like, okay, is this a tear down or can we fix it? And then you have the blank canvas of the land. That's like, okay, like what does this look like? And then if you add in other layers, like we do in your life, like, well, how do we do it sustainably? And how do we do it where we're not gentrifying people? Like what is this long-term strategy going to be? Yeah. And so that, again, that involves many, many different counterparts. Mm -hmm. Um, what are some of the different challenges that you've had in working with. I mean, again, you've got, it sounds like maybe some competing interests there, right? You've Mm -hmm. got the municipalities, you've got the private companies, you've got the residents. How do you balance all of those together to try to find an outcome? So prior to land use, I studied economic development and prior to economic development, I got into real estate through sales. So when I'm figuring out what this should look like, I'm trying to make it into an attractive package for everybody involved. Like, what does this package look like? And once I can envision it and I have the architects do the renderings about what it can be, and it's not pie in the sky. It's definitely a heavy lift. You have to be on the ground doing the work. But once you can eliminate the questions for everybody, they're like, okay, this makes sense. And then it comes down to a spreadsheet. And it's like, well, is it worth my time to make X amount of money back? Some investors are down for it, some aren't. Um, but that's, that's the name of the game. And it's exciting. Like, when do you... When you get a chance to like create skylines, right? That's fun. <clears throat> yeah. And now I guess where we're at, you know, again, your fall of 2022 mm-hmm. heading into some, you most would agree some relatively uncertain economic times. Mm-hmm. Do you see, does that create more opportunity or does that create more risk for some of these, these bigger projects, heavier lift projects? So it depends. It depends on the, the investors, just long-term strategy. If you're playing with long money, we're talking 10, 20 years, you're going to refinance they're not really worried that dry powder on the side. But if we're talking about switching from fix and flip people or like quick value add that may be underfunded, then it's going to be challenging for them. They're going to, they're going to wait it out. They're going to want to be a little more conservative in what they're doing. But in these long-term like recreating neighborhoods, the people that get involved with that are normally well-financed and they're affected, but not as to the detriment that the lower level investors right so looking at it on a long enough term horizon that the projects that you're undertaking are not again it's it's not just a kind of light value add these are a lot of heavy lift over a long period of time and generally capital sources that will be along for that ride regardless of the cycle right they're buy and hold strategies Um, a lot of times you have multiple investors coming in so we may have one investor that's going to be one part of this larger project and in a couple years as things 
settle down. Another investor comes on and we can start to pull in people. We don't need a huge capital outlay in the beginning. We just know it's going to take a really long time to achieve the vision. Mm -hmm. And now we've seen, again, in our space, there was a lot of early talk about opportunity zones. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that we've seen them fully leveraged to the extent that we had all hoped mm -hmm. in the beginning. Just kind of curious, what have you seen? Ha has it had an impact or has it had the impact that we would have hoped that it had? So I know in my communities in New England, not so much. Um, even myself, I just started to work with Opportunity Zone funds because there's just levels of bureaucracy to it. And to really get the full benefit of Opportunity Zone, you have to play a long money game. But these people might not be long money people. So it's a cool vehicle, definitely not going to solve any problems off the bat. But I know we have two tracks in in Hartford, one is very interesting to me because it's across the street from a, a soccer stadium. City owns a lot, Opportunity Zone Fund, like we can find people to invest in it, but there's no vision for it. So I started to kick around, like what could this look like? Do we build townhouses here and retail on the bottom? Can we sell it? Can we help solve home ownership? Like what, what does this package look like again? How do we get people excited about this, but also make sure it makes money for the investors? So I've been toying around with that for probably for like three or four months now. And it's, uh, I think I'm getting to a point where I could shop it around and start to get some interest in it. But So when you're looking at a new project or a new area or a new market, what are some of the things that you're looking for that, that make it be a good candidate for putting the amount of effort in that you have to put in to, to make it, just to realize it? So I'm passionate, passionate about it all, all the time. Like this is... I dream this stuff um and i'm big on the ground so i enjoy walking it so i can walk by something like something's missing here I'm like what's missing and then you start to look you're like this is what's missing and you dig into the numbers um so i don't think there's necessarily a formula for what i'm looking at or how i pick out an area it's just you feel like something should be there and then you start digging the numbers and figure out is it feasible I'm like okay like there's the potential to put something here and this is what it needs to be. And how do we start to work towards that? And then um, is it, are, are you initiating these conversations? Are you generally in, is a, is a municipality coming to you? Like how, how do you, how does that engagement begin usually? So it's a little bit of both. A lot of times it's me. I'll be in a town and I'll be like, wow, what a great town. It has so much potential. And when I start saying that, I'm like, okay, like There's where is this here, potential? Yeah. And yeah. I start to peek down alleys, look in corners, look at the architecture of things and figure out, okay, like, well, if we can put three stories on top of that, we're going to have good human scale and that's going to cost X amount of money. But that then makes it more approachable for investors to build on this lot over here. And then it all kind of falls together. So a bunch of different puzzle pieces into uh, hopefully a cohesive picture. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And then how has that changed? Obviously, you know, coming out of the pandemic, um, redevelopment and, and kind of urbanization again. Mm -hmm. Um where are you seeing interest in terms of more urban core opportunities? I mean, are there opportunistic, and I'm, I'm, it's hard to see in a podcast, I'm air quoting, mm -hmm. are there opportunistic opportunities in primary markets or, or are you looking more at the kind of outlying secondary tertiary markets for these opportunities? So in downtowns, typically there's a lot of opportunity, whether it's city or secondary tertiary, there's a lot of infill development that can be had because we had... Um, just like the old school revitalization where they're like, oh, tear down the building and do urban revitalization. And now you have all these parking lots and like, okay, so you can start from there and go ground up. Sometimes there are buildings that just kind of fell apart. And then we call it like a, like the missing tooth on, on Main Street. You're like, oh, it'd be like brick building, vacant lot, brick building. We're like, how do we make that a cohesive Main Street? What building goes in there? And then it, what, what numbers make that building work? So how many units do I need to get here? And will zoning allow me to do that? And there's actually a great app that's out um, program called Deep Blocks. And Olivia um, is from Miami. And it just helps put together these um, parcels. Like you can make assemblages and it can tell you what you can build there and uh, what you can create. We've worked together, I don't know, probably like the last couple of months as she's been building this app, but it makes it really easy to do that type of work. And I was like, I will sign up for that immediately because it gives you all the information, the demographic information, how high you can build the zoning info. And you're like, this is amazing. Um, so we talk often and I think that's going to help reshape these opportunities coming out of the pandemic. Good. Well, we'll, uh, we'll put links in the show notes for that for yeah, sure. She's awesome. Um, and then as we think about the risks of those projects and 
there's there's added layers of risks when you're talking about zoning when you're talking about you know if you have to do any kind of rezoning or, or different changes to land use um, how do you think about the risks when you're taking on those kinds of projects versus like your typical value add or, or maybe what are some of the more um, lesser known risks when you're embarking on a project of that that scale that lift so m most risk in real estate i circle back to to people place in politics always the same <laughs> that's it's regardless always going to be of one of at. those regardless <laughs> of where you are what the yeah. opportunity is um and the biggest thing i think for developers is the politics is are they ready are they ready to do what's necessary to let this project happen and if you come up against them and the politics and people aren't ready to do it you're just throwing Probably your money away. Happen. Yeah. I, I can paint a beautiful picture, but if they're not down tagging on their wall, it just sits in a closet. Yeah. That's, that's what that is. And that's unfortunate because there's a lot of communities that just aren't ready. They act like they're ready. They think they're ready. But then when it comes to putting pen to paper and the capitals there, they're balking. And, and that's unfortunate. And how do you get a read on that? I mean, that's just, that's just, you get a feel for it. I mean, there, there's probably not a very easy way to quantify that. <laughs> you start conversations really, really early. Um, like, as I'm envisioning something, I'm having conversations with people and just like poking around. They're like, oh, like, well, if this was possible, like, what would you think of this? Or just like, dropping what hints, do you, right, just like hints. little breadcrumbs yeah. along the yeah. way, like leading them there. I want to lead you to this conclusion that something should go there. I'm like, that's a great idea. Like, they think they thought of it. They're like, you know what we should do over by that soccer stadium? We should put in some retail and some apartments. <laughs> a, I'm like, yes, great idea. yes, that, that's a great I'm idea. Glad I'm you like, thought wow, I'm so happy you thought about it. <laughs> Meanwhile, it's been three years of leading them to this yeah. conclusion. Um, and even when you do that, it's still not guaranteed it's going to go through. But your capital outlay is still minimal. So, And so now you mentioned that project next to soccer stadium. Mm -hmm. that you think there should be something going on there. Um, what are maybe some of the projects that are that you've recently worked on that are interesting or exciting and, and maybe what what are you looking at that's, uh, that you see maybe as the next step in, in development of your approach to these? What are you looking at, these changes, anything new uh, that you're thinking about? So I play I mean, mostly in, in New England. I live in Connecticut. So I've been very bullish on Bridgeport for 10 years um, just by proximity to the city. Fairfield County is very, if you go by the people that live there, it's not very wealthy, but the people that do live there, like stats versus what's going on. Fairfield in that area, they can't expand towards the city. They have to push out. That means they're going to push into Bridgeport proper, the downtown city. Prices come up there. You start to make that attractive. Then it hops over the river, goes to Milford, all these other towns. Everything rises with that. Um, so I'm really interested in Bridgeport, um, despite what the numbers say. Uh, there's a big vision to be had there. Um, Hartford... I live in Hartford, it's hit or miss. There's opportunity there. I would go with that. Springfield, Massachusetts, um, I think is cool. And I think for people that want to be ahead of kind of what I'm working on, I would look towards climate migration. Like, what are those cities? Like, where are people going to go to as climate changes? And is that going to push you more towards upstate New York, like the Catskills, where it's temperate, not too cold? You still have all four seasons, but you don't have to worry about ocean level rise and droughts forest fire stuff like that what does that look like um in in the future because right now a lot of like institutional money is going to kind of the southern smile because they're like oh rents can grow but i'm like you're dealing with these um, crazy temperatures and climate change and just storms and i'm like what's the risk in that um so i'm observing kind of all those trends at this at the moment yeah and now if you're a, a real estate owner developer manager and maybe you're getting a little bit uh, a little bit bored of the easy value add stuff and you mm -hmm. want to start dabbling in some of these bigger term projects what is the like what's the scale or what are some of the steps that people can take if they're trying to expand their business into some of these more longer term a little riskier more developmentally intensive process projects yeah I mean I guess the challenge is breaking away from what you know so the average real estate investor that's been in the game for a while, wants to have like 100 units, something they can manage, on-site property management, roll through there, and it's going to be there. But to really play in secondary markets in opportunistic environments, you have to be hands-on. You, you really, like it's a labor of love. You, you want to be out there. Of the template, right. right? Yeah. You got to go down there. You're going to talk to community people. You're going to be not just an investor. You're almost an activist investor. Like you're that involved in the project. Um, and I think for a certain tier of investor that likes to be in projects like that, 
they're going to have tons of opportunity. But if they want to be hands-off investors, it's really difficult to play in opportunistic markets unless you have a great team. Yeah, perfect. I think, yeah, awesome point there on the team. It all comes down to the team, right? I mean, there's <laughs> a lot of execution that comes into uh, in these projects. So I think that's a, that's a good point. Get right. the team together and, and get everybody to buy into that vision, right? Because it sounds like these aren't, uh, these aren't the easiest projects to envision maybe day one. Right, definitely, definitely not. Perfect. Well, Tim, I think that's a great, uh, great spot to wrap it up. Thank you for, uh, for coming on today. Why don't you tell listeners a little bit more how they can learn about what, uh, what you're up to? Yeah. So the easiest way to follow what I'm up to is to check out my LinkedIn page. It's, uh, linkedin.com backslash the Tim Moore. And we'll I've have links in the show notes. Yeah. For that. <laughs> like pretty easy. I like locked down that name yeah, a couple years ago. I was like, the Tim Moore. I was like, who are you? Well, that's that vision. I'm planning yeah, the long term vision. Ahead. I love it. Um, but yeah, that's the best way to keep in contact with me or at my um, email, shoot me an email at timothy.more at uli.org. Thank you, Tim. Next up, we've got Craig Leibowitz, Executive Director of Innovation and Insight at Avis & Young. Craig joined us to discuss highlights from his presentation at the fall meeting called The Vitality Index, Taking the Pulse of the Return to the City Center. The Vitality Index is a real-time window into the movement of people in major North American cities, and Craig shares with us how investors can use this data to inform their decisions. Don't forget to check the show notes for the link to the Vitality Index so that you can follow along with the conversation. Here's Craig. Well, Craig, thank you so much for taking some time to join us here at the fall meeting. Just got to watch your panel. Fascinating stuff, things that we've been talking about for years. You guys are putting some data to, so... Thanks for taking some time, and why don't you tell us about what you do with Avis and Young and your Vitality Index? Sure. Thanks for having me. So, uh, I am the executive director of our Innovation and Insight Advisory team in the United States, and really my directive is to design and deliver custom data analytics solutions so our clients can navigate the next normal, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, occupiers, investors, developers, and public entities. So the next normal, we've talked about the new normal, I don't know if we're there yet, but mm -hmm. what's what's the next normal? Next normal evolves by the day. And uh, <laughs> the good news is we have the data to substantiate like what's evolving yeah. as it evolves in an environment that has really no precedent. And that's yeah. actually why we created the Vitality Index, which is published on the avisonyoung.com website. Mm -hmm. It's the second thing you'll see, and it measures using mobility data what's happening across unique areas of interest, not just offices, mm -hmm. but what's happening in, in terms of you know, hospitality, recreation, and tourism destinations, schools, retailers, and so forth. Yeah, and so we'll have links in the show notes to that uh, link, and you were showing in a demo on your panel, um, tons of data that you can pour through and, and look at different categories. So one of the things you talked about was a trend that we've all been talking about is this suburbanization and then return to core. Mm -hmm. um, what is some of the data that you guys have uncovered with those two trends? So suburbanization unequivocally occurred. Mm -hmm. And um, as speaking from experience, living in New York City throughout the lockdown period, cities were simply not a pleasant place to be right. under some circumstances. And what people did is they migrated out of cities to be with family or just to be in Montauk or whatever it was. Um, because it was a health and safety concern from mm -hmm. a virus perspective, higher perceived quality of life outside of cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, and obviously, like that, that occurred, and the data substantiates it in a really meaningful way. But as virus-related concerns started to subside, we started to see people return to cities mm -hmm. in a more meaningful way, mm -hmm. which meant that they become more vibrant. Are they as vibrant as they was? The data says not exactly. Yeah. But we're definitely getting closer to that next normal, whatever yeah. that next normal Whatever the entails. next normal is. Um, and one of the stats you showed was that there's a, a, a return for most, well, not most, but some of the categories, right? I think you, put, you called out uh, education and hospitality have almost returned back to where they were pre-COVID. So mm -hmm. the, the people are back. I think you said the people are back, but they just still don't want to go to the office. <laughs> so office, office occupancy is still substantially down mm -hmm. just as a, as a whole, right? Mm-hmm. And then you also pulled back uh, the more temporary, I think you know, third-party office providers, I forget how you classified them, but mm -hmm. those have almost returned back to normal, right? So yep. you, you see even uh, within an asset class as broad as office, you have to get more, more, more micro to determine where those trends are actually going. That's exactly right. And the further we could parse and isolate the data, macro and micro, mm -hmm. 
the more so we could and really use it to substantiate and inform decisions. Mm -hmm. And what's really fascinating is like when we looked at the office data in particular, while we're not close to where we stood pre-COVID in any respect, mm -hmm. most, if not really all, nearly all employers are really leveraging a hybrid work strategy yeah. in some respects. We're noticing that when, it, when we look at flexible office providers, so those are um, like third party operators where you could have touchdown space for a shortened period of time. Mm -hmm. Um, they'll sign license agreements for one or two years in some circumstances, or maybe a little bit longer. But it further substantiates, from an occupier's perspective, the lack of certainty they have mm -hmm. as it relates to navigating their return to office efforts. Yeah, And it's so critically important because in a demand-driven environment, the first order of operations is return to the office. And then they could effectuate their long-term space decisions yeah. once they have an understanding of how much space they need. Um, and those flexible office providers serve as an outlet right. that gives them, a buys them a little bit more time. For, yeah, exactly. And so when you when you think about one of the things we've we've continually explored since the beginning of the pandemic is where are what are the trends that were already underway in the the pandemic accelerated those versus some fundamental changes to how they structurally work. Um, seeing your data on return to office currently, mm -hmm. do you think that's a just a fundamental shift in how we think about office space, what, how we use office space, what that means, or is that, is that is it going to come back? I'm just curious if there's anything in the data that, that shows any predictive trends there. It's a really interesting point. We're having point. a crystal ball here. We don't <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's a really interesting point because while most people will point to what happened post-COVID, the office evolution was occurring pre-COVID as well. Yeah. More people were working remotely more frequently mm -hmm. in 2017, 2018, 2019, uh, because technology enabled our workforce to do exactly that. Right. And to your point, COVID served as an accelerator of that trend. Yeah. So uh, working in commercial real estate, if you're in the office on Fridays, you're probably looking around by yourself right. <laughs> under most circumstances. And this was, this was pre-COVID, yeah. especially during the summer. And uh, now what we're finding is that if people based on the function of how they work um, and how uh, what makes them productive. Mm -hmm. So if you're an independent contractor or software developer, you could probably work anywhere. You mm -hmm. don't necessarily need to be within an office, but if you're meeting with clients every day, there's an expectation that you're gonna have to be in the office. Mm -hmm. Or if you need to access technology or collaborate with work, fellow workers, then there's this expectation you have to return to the office. Right. What's happening in terms of the economic backdrop, of course, is that there's a greater expectation of people returning to the office given that nudge from um, what's becoming more economic turmoil mm -hmm. is providing incentive for them to do so. But the point I made a few moments ago is, listen, we're going to get to some seed of uh, equilibrium, so to speak, whether it's 30% below or 40% below, pre-COVID levels totally remains to be seen. Mm -hmm but we'll get there at some point. Um, absent some unforeseen black swan events yeah. that could transform that. And once we reach that point, it's gonna serve as a really strong proxy for how much space office, most office occupiers are gonna need yeah. in the future state. And so that will then be the, the quote, new normal, right? How do mm -hmm. we know when we're there? Yeah, um, the data will help to substantiate it yeah. ultimately. And, and so are you looking at just a consistency over a period of time? Yep. Is that a year, two years? What, what kind of time frame. I mean, everything, yeah. everything has moved so quickly in yeah. these last couple of years. I'm just curious, what is your sense of timeline to see when we've, we've gotten to a point of stabilization, some of these different factors? My guess of it is four to six months, okay. uh, really after the holiday season, Yeah, I would say. There's, that's the next, 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 next milestone yeah. after probably five <laughs> of these milestones. Labor Day serving is the most recent one, Yeah, um, whereby we're going to have a really strong understanding of, or a stronger understanding of where office occupiers Yeah. Um, how often they're returning to offices and what it ultimately means, not just for you know office landlords or office markets, but for economies yeah. more broadly. I think that is something that's interesting. When we got into the COVID environment, it seemed like the data was shifting so quickly. And from an asset class that's always thought in terms of quarters, if not years, mm -hmm. um, that was a big shift, I think, for a lot of people that were trying to 
to leverage this new data that was coming in so frequently from the fire hose to make these decisions. Mm -hmm. So how has, how has that changed what you're doing with this vitality index? I mean, you're getting almost real-time data mm -hmm. from, and maybe tell us a little bit about how you're collecting that data, but I'm just curious, with the accessibility to this real-time data, how does that change the decision-making process from mm -hmm. investors and, and users of these spaces? Today, modern occupiers, investors, developers need to reference data when they're substantiating a decision, whether mm -hmm. it's buy, hold, sell, lease, sublease, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we're endeavoring to be the source of truth there. Yeah. And from that perspective, we, we're just using one select data point in terms of mobility data to reinforce how uh, we're establishing, our, establishing ourselves as that source of truth. Mm -hmm. And what we did was we said, you know, early on, actually last year, we released an office vitality index. Mm -hmm. And we were like kind of scratching our heads like, you know what, this isn't really capturing the essence of what we want to capture because it's not, it's real time, but it may not be as predictive as we would like. Mm -hmm. And when we listen to what office CEOs say in their memos to employer, employees uh, mandating returns to the office, they'll point to education, like students return to class, and they'll point to... Um, people returning everywhere else. Yeah. And that's exactly what we, the essence of what we wanted to capture in Where the report. Where is the everywhere else? <laughs> uh, the everywhere else yeah. being like museums, stadiums, like, yeah. okay, you were at Yankee Stadium on Friday afternoon, like, you should be back in the office, right? right? Um, and that's exactly what they'll point to, and that's what we wanted to capture. And it's yeah. not just for office personas, but it's also for all personas yeah. for their reference. And we isolated or geofenced unique areas of interest throughout 50 two cities mm -hmm. across North America from which we could really inform those decisions yeah. in a more progressive way. And so what, did, what were you seeing in some of those other asset classes in retail or I mean, multifamily? Obviously, we know that held mm -hmm. up very well, but I'm curious, yeah. what did you see in retail? Retail, um, we're getting to some semblance of normalcy. Um, we actually, <laughs> we reference online retail, which is actually last mile distribution centers. Mm -hmm. And the mobility data has actually been pretty low Interestingly, um, as it relates to that asset class in particular, I think that really speaks to supply chain issues, mm -hmm. um, not just like the materials themselves, but also workforce. Yeah. Um, so that's an industry that's faced some acute challenges, yeah. especially in recent months. Um, but as it relates to in-person retail experiences, they've returned to some semblance of normalcy, yeah. um, with the top of list being retail corridors, because tourists have returned, residents are back in cities, and office workers are kind of back. Yeah. So they're not necessarily back to normal, but they're reasonably back to normal minus the office workers um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And the data substantiates that. Um, inter and we also have a local area of interest for retailers. Those are grocery stores. Okay. And we're not seeing the same level of visitor volumes we saw pre-COVID, but it's back to some semblance of normalcy. And yeah. it had been, been back to normal for quite a long period of time, which substantially the people were actually back yeah. in locations, cities, right. suburbs, et cetera. Um, and the multifamily rental data substantiates that. Good. So what's, uh, what's next for you guys with data, how you analyze this, and, and how can the listeners um, leverage that to the most in their businesses? So I would say is that, um, again, we're kind of endeavoring to be the source of truth there from a data perspective, mm -hmm. data, data analytics, data science, data visualization. And the Vitality Index is just one minute component of or basically the tip of the iceberg of what our capabilities are. Yeah. So we'd, uh, we'd encourage your listeners just to reach out, have a dialogue with us. If there's an opportunity for us to use our platform called Avant to help to inform those decisions, we're happy to be a partner for them. Perfect. Well, uh, let us know where we, can, uh, where we can find all the data. Sure. So, uh, avisonyoung.com. Um, if you go on the website, it'll be one of the first things you see. It's called the Vitality Index. And on that, you'll have my contact information as well and ways to subscribe. Thanks, Craig. That was great. Now we're going to hear more insights from the team at Avis and Young as Eric Foster, principal and head of the industrial capital markets, shares insights from the panel he moderated at the fall meeting, there's a traffic jam in the shipping lane, supply chain and logistics issues, and the path forward. In this conversation, Eric breaks down how the supply chain issues have been impacting the U.S. real estate market and what to look for next. 
Well, Eric, thanks so much for taking a few minutes of your day to, to share what's going on at the fall meeting here in Dallas. Thanks, Adam. Happy to be here. Um, so tell us about yourself and, and the work that you're doing with Avis and Young. So I run our industrial capital markets platform. Mm -hmm. uh, we are a global services company, the largest privately held global services company uh, in the world. And the industrial space has obviously been very, very active. Mm -hmm. And from an investment standpoint, uh, we're doing work all across the globe, mainly here in the United States. And as far as, you know, in 2022, it started off quite robust. And obviously, there have been some changes in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. It slowed things down a little bit. But still, it's, it's the asset class to be in, I believe. Yeah. And so now, the panel that you're moderating mm -hmm. uh, was yesterday. Tell mm -hmm. us about that panel, who was on it, what were some of the, the key points? Yeah, so I got, I got Gray Bouchelon, who runs Nuveen's uh, industrial platform, as well as uh, Trey uh, Adams, who uh, runs real estate for NFI, which is a, a logistics uh, and trucking company, and uh, Carl Questenberry, who's with our consulting group. So w w I, I devised the panel so that we had an, an owner's perspective, a user's perspective, and then also sort of a third-party consultant perspective. Mm -hmm. And from that, we were able to really dissect the market, talk about some of the hot-button issues, where's the market heading, uh, what's the investment look like, investment market look like, what does tenant demand look like, and what are some of the things in 23 that we need to be aware of. Mm -hmm. And so share a little bit of that with us. What does uh, tenant demand look like? How's it doing from an investment yeah. asset class? And, and then... Uh, a little bit more deep, we'll, we'll talk into some of the logistics issues that we're, we're seeing right now. So the investment market, I, I think, was the first question mm -hmm. you asked. Um, it's been on pause for the past couple of months, given the interest rate environment. Mm -hmm. uh, that's probably going to continue for a little bit, and then it will uh, hopefully start to manifest itself into more liquidity through the debt markets as 23 uh, comes alive. Uh, and But uh, fingers crossed on that. The, uh, the logistics market is... Um, is changing uh, the uh, the shipping concerns that we had during the pandemic and maybe a, a year or so ago with some of the port congestion and things like that have mm -hmm. have seemed to ease a bit, but there's still challenges. Yeah. And so when we see, so, I mean, again, we hear news about supply chain issues all the mm -hmm. time, right? Mm -hmm. um, maybe we'll see it in the, in the supermarket where shelves still seem like they're not quite at full stockage levels. Yeah, for sure. Um, is that just a reverberation from such a such a hit during the pandemic time, or is there something else going on that's that's causing some of the supply chain issues these yeah, days? Yeah, I, I think what you're seeing is I think you're seeing users recalculate and reformulate how they are looking at their supply chains. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was a shock, and I think it was a bit of a, um, and we're we're recovering from that. But when you, you know, you think about industrial. As an asset class, it, you know, traditionally before the pandemic made it keenly aware of, of e-commerce, you know, it supplied retail, it supplied consumers, there was also a manufacturing element. Well, all mm -hmm. those things remain. Uh, but now the e-commerce element is, much, is a much bigger part of the supply chain. And as our economy and population grows, we still are a consumer-based economy, we still need those logistics and supply chains to run efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, what we're seeing is we're, we're seeing some folks begin to look at um, sort of what happens if we have another disruption in the West Coast ports? What do my East Coast mm -hmm. ports look like? If there's a disruption in the East, what does it look like in the West? How do I get goods from China? What about the central U.S.? Is there enough rail to supply or intermodal facilities? Mm -hmm. Are they able to supply my goods and service, my goods rather, to the places that they need to go to? Um, a, a lot of logistics is still consumer based mm -hmm. and we're looking at population growth and you you know we talk about in the institutional real estate uh, investment side of things we talk about the smile regions and mm -hmm. the growth regions of the country um, but you know I live in Chicago it's still about 10 million people we still eat and we still drink and we <laughs> still go to sports games and mm -hmm. you know there's so there's a base of, of that economy that still needs to be served mm -hmm. uh, but how how people will adjust uh, and are adjusting in the coming days, I think has yet to be seen, but there are lessons that are learned through the pandemic that are that are certainly causing people to make different decisions about locations and uh, and how they use their logistics. Mm -hmm. And so how, how are you seeing, again, you mentioned kind of East Coast ports, West Coast ports, disruptions on one will affect mm -hmm. the others. Um, for listeners of this, whether they're developers, owners, occupiers of these buildings, how are things looking differently on the coastal markets versus maybe on some of the inland, more intermodal markets? Are they seeing 
similar demand levels? Is there different effects on the intermodal when you get to a port? Like, how does that all connect? Well, I mean, connect? you know, two things. That's a pretty um, bad pun. Yeah. No, I mean, no, I, I, I think I get your question. So, the, you know, L.A. is the obviously one of the biggest and most viable ports in the States and, and still continues to be. But you're seeing markets um, like Charleston and also Savannah mm-hmm. really grow to provide an East Coast uh, access entry point for goods coming through um, coming through the west instead of going to LA hopping on a rail and then going all the way east um, a lot of folks are you know choosing to go through the Panama Canal and come up uh, because they come up through Savannah and Charleston or New Jersey and, uh, because the ports have been widened and, and deepened they can handle more uh, they can handle more velocity mm-hmm. and more users and you know Savannah as a as a real estate uh, as a real estate center has so much development potentially planned, uh, they could potentially develop. I don't I don't think it'll all come to fruition. They could potentially develop uh, du- double the square footage that is currently there mm-hmm. at the Port of Savannah. So it, it there's a lot of a lot of opportunity. And do you see when you look across maybe the product spectrum with an industrial, if you're looking more bigger box, you know half a million, million square foot kind of distribution mm-hmm. centers. Um, are you seeing much of a difference in demand between size of the facilities or, or whether it's more of a kind of local regional flex space? Or are you seeing just increased demand across all industrial uses right now? Yeah, I, yeah. I think the, the easy answer is yes. We're seeing more demand across all uses. Um, the, you know, the big box um, will continue to be uh, in demand. You have you know, very strong public companies that need that big demand, mm-hmm. big box uh, space. But you're also seeing, you know, onshoring is real. We actually wrote mm-hmm. about this in our Sightlines report um, a couple of weeks ago about the on- the insurgence of, of onshoring and how uh, people are trying to get away from Southeast Asia as the manufacturing mm-hmm. uh, center, but maybe move that to Mexico or, or closer. So some of the smaller facilities, maybe more flex in nature or, mm-hmm. or um, regional manufacturing facilities are putting demands on uh, on some of the smaller uses as well. It, you know, it, at the end of the day, the whether the debt markets have, you know, had a big impact on uh, the near term or not, you know, industrial is going to continue for the foreseeable future to be, you know, the bellwether uh, asset class among the four. Mm-hmm. Uh, multifamily probably will be you know, a very close second, and then you know you've you've got healthcare and uh, those kinds of things, uh, but it's really going to be in demand from a use base basis and and from a tenant basis, which is going to is going to continue to drive that investor demand. Yeah, and that's certainly what we've seen in the investment world, right? Is just industrial is as hot as it can be, and, and again, mm-hmm. like we see really any signs of that changing anytime soon. So, um, for listeners of this, are there any? new trends you guys are paying attention to, any new data points that mm-hmm. investors can be seeing or maybe get some new insights as to whether we're getting to a new next stage or new or normal? Yeah, I think there's a couple of things on the horizon within the industrial space. And I, you know, the military guys would call it strategy creep. And, and I, in what I, what you look at, and if you look out at the uh, industrial landscape, you know, there's people that want to be in you know, buy the big box industrial building in mm-hmm. L.A. or Dallas or Chicago or New Jersey. That's that's obviously a core strategy. Then there's you know smaller box and flex and infill. But we're also seeing we're also seeing this uh, covered land play, the uh, transload mm-hmm. um, uh, sort of truck terminal uh, platforms that are really really becoming viable. Uh, we sold a, a 53 asset portfolio. Uh, two years ago in 17 different states, and it was bought by a major institution. And they wanted to add that to their portfolio because of the viability of these assets. And mm-hmm. a lot of these assets are smaller in use. Their credit quality is not necessarily that great. It can be. Um, and they're tougher buildings. They get a lot mm-hmm. of use. They're also small buildings on very large land sites. So it's not a typical industrial profile. Uh, but that is going to continue. The other thing that we're seeing is this uh, what folks are calling the IOS the industrial outdoor storage mm. uh where you know you're 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 doing, you're buying lots for uh, trailer storage and you know which is basically an industrial building in the back of a of a, a of truck trailer mm-hmm. and so there's a lot of institutional money chasing that uh that those platforms and those businesses mm. they are uh 
they're tough to find. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of the those two sorts of the truck lots and the and the transload facilities. There's a bit of nimbyism, uh, you know, not in my backyard because mm-hmm. of the heavy use and the truck traffic and things like that. So those assets are, are a little bit tougher to unearth uh, for the aggregators. But I, I think you're going to continue to see those two strategies really, really push forward here in the coming years. Thanks, Craig. Last up and rounding out our guests from the team at Avis and Young is Carl Questenberry, Senior Director. Carl was on the same panel that Eric moderated and shares insights into today's most pressing supply chain and logistics issues. Here's Carl. Well, Carl, thank you so much for spending some time with us here at the fall meeting. We'd love to uh, have you tell us a little bit about the work you do with Avis and Young. Well, my name is Carl Questenberry and I'm Senior Director of the Avis and Young Consulting Group. I focus on supply chain matters, uh, location strategy, labor analytics, uh, and economic incentives to induce organizations to make investment in particular geographies. I've been doing this for 35 years. So you know you know what's going on. <laughs> I'd like to hope so. <laughs> um, so tell us about the panel that you were on um, and, and some of the, the topics that you guys covered there. Sure. So the uh, conference yesterday, the session, was on, in essence, supply chain disruption. Mm-hmm where what happened the why mm-hmm. and what it looks like in the future mm-hmm. and so we were talking uh, earlier with with eric um you know we i think we still see the effects of that today grocery stores you know supermarket shelves aren't necessarily stocked is that a is that related is that still part of this disruption that we felt when COVID hit was that already happening prior to COVID, and that was just exacerbated through that can you tell us take us through the history of what, what kind of has gotten us to where we're feeling that impact today Great question. I think it's a convergent of a convergence of many factors. Mm-hmm. Um, labor being one of them, the production of goods, um, although that appears to be somewhat cor- corrected, mm-hmm. um, but there's unprecedented backlogs of equipment uh, ranging from HVAC HVAC systems. Um, other large white goods, mm-hmm. uh, transformers, electrical switch gears that have extensive long lead times on them mm-hmm. right now that are uh, impeding the progress of development for the industrial sector. Okay. And so were there were there trends that were already kind of underway that were, were just exacerbated by the shock, or is this a new development? Again, a, convergent, yeah. a convergence of issues. I think that uh, most consumers are experiencing the impact of price increases as a result of a domino effect. You've got uh, the, the event of COVID, the supply chain disruption that, that occurred from that. Mm-hmm. You have rising interest rates. You have labor shortages, mm-hmm. uh, geopolitical tensions, issues, mm-hmm. tariffs, uh, and public policy major public policy initiatives here in the United States, the domestic policies. It's all a convergence of these elements that are driving costs up faster than wage growth. Mm -hmm. Uh, And this most negatively impacts the middle and lower income earners. Yeah. And so now let's maybe talk about the logistics side of it. You you mentioned the manufacturing is is backed up and that's kind of impeding some of the progress. Um, And then there's a labor shortage component of that, right? How, How do you maybe look at those? Again, is that all it's all intertwined, of course, right? But maybe you can split out a little bit of some of the labor issues with more of the you know, facilities or, or hard, hard goods side of it. Well, I think from the labor side, because of the uh, public policy initiatives that were implemented, it really wasn't incentivizing going to work. And culture is one of the most difficult things to change. Mm-hmm. And there has been a cultural shift on how work is viewed. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, labor seems to ha- currently have an upper hand over the institution relative to the tastes and preferences and desires of the of the workforce on how they interact with physical space. Mm-hmm. So coming back to work, what that looks like in the industrial and manufacturing sector, you have to be at work. Mm-hmm. You don't have the luxury of right, being it's remote. Right, not a remote thing. W- correct. Yeah. So in that mm-hmm. regard, the only... Um, the only uh, appealing strategy from a uh, organization is to increase pay, mm-hmm. to bring them back into the workforce. And I think that the strongest indicator uh, 
of organizations that are being successful with this approach is not just the uh, increased labor wage that they're providing, mm -hmm. but creating a culture of engagement to where uh, everybody feels relevant. Mm -hmm. And where, where are we at in that transition? Do, is that something, are we starting to see some normalization? Is there, are we early stages of getting back to that engagement and, and getting the back to work? Like where, where do you see that we're at in that, that shift or that cycle, do you think? I think we're at the infancy of what a new normalization will look like. Yeah. Um, I don't think that we um, are at the halfway mark of what that ultimately ends up being. Yeah. And that organizations are in a very agile mindset right it now. You have to be, right? You have sure. to be, yeah. Sure. So the flexibility associated with the model that will be successful in the future has yet to be determined. Yeah. But the winners, the organizations that come out of this stage, they're going to be the real winners because they'll, in essence, be first to market with an organizational cultural dynamic mm -hmm. that they have mastered and become employers of choice. And so what are, what are some of the tactical things around that? What, what does that actually look like in practice? Well, again, I think it is about uh, engagement of the work of the workers mm -hmm. uh, with senior leadership. Um, they have to strong leadership really isn't given the the credit it's due, but a good strong leader that can effectively communicate the vision mm -hmm. and be authentic establishes buy in, mm -hmm. and that's what we're saying that the workers really want to have mm -hmm. and feel that, again that they're relevant to the organization it's not so much about workplace strategy and ping pong tables and, and massage <laughs> tables or any of that it's really on how they engage with the organization mm -hmm. being fluid within an office environment or even in a remote environment yeah and you know we've talked a lot about the office environment and just the the nature of of how we use the space is changing right i think there's definitely some fundamental shifts of that um how do you see this new culture of, of work and engagement reflecting in the actual built space? Is that, is that changing the nature of the real estate, the physical real estate itself, or is that mostly um, more people internally of, of how those facilities are already constructed? Well, I think from a workflow standpoint, it dramatically shifts the model from traditional understanding of real estate mm -hmm. where I'm going to plot it out and you get a, a six by six or a 10 by 10 cubicle. Mm -hmm. It's moving towards um, a, an advancement of uh, open bullpen dynamics where mm -hmm. there's uh, shifting and common uh, interaction amongst people in small little group team environments throughout the space. However, from a demand standpoint, I think that current inventory levels for office space for the people that need to be at work mm -hmm. and for, for those office functions is forever shifted. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is I think that the demand for office space, they're going to be doing more with less. Mm -hmm. So the existing inventory to fill back up, I think is going to take an extended period of time uh, when balanced against historical trends of what uh, uh, development and absorption has been. Yeah. And so then getting back to some of these supply chain disruptions, um, are we are we in a temporary state? Is it? It seems like we're getting some improvements as as things start to get to again kind of that new normalization. Um, it's been a rough couple of years. Where do you see the next couple of years? Are we going to get to more of a normal flow of goods, or is this a is this a are there fundamental shifts of how the supply chain functions as a result of what we've been through the last couple of years? That's a great question, and a, again, uh, multifaceted drivers. Mm -hmm. Uh, to formulate an answer. I think it's forever shifted. Yeah. I think the geopolitical theater is the, the, the greatest um, inducer potential for risk for disruption mm -hmm. uh, that's really driving nearshoring and onshoring, mm -hmm. friendly, friendly foes, so to speak. Um, I think that the investment that's being driven by uh, the federal government on critical industries, mm -hmm. uh, lithium battery sector, semiconductor sector, and all of the supply ch suppliers of those individual uh, ecosystems, mm -hmm. all onshoring, is going to be the most significant driver of industrial real estate in, in, in association with e-commerce for the United States for a five to ten year horizon. Mm -hmm. 
And then maybe taking a look at those different categories, right? We talk about <clears throat> more of the logistics on the coastal markets, port cities and whatnot. Um, and then you look all the way down the chain to e-commerce and that last mile delivery. Those products have to touch a number of different kinds of facilities, right? All kind of within the industrial logistics space. So maybe how are you seeing some of the impacts as you look at that, the flow of goods from a port city down to a last mile distribution center in middle America? Well, you know, what is a port city? I think that may shift mm -hmm. by general definition. Mm -hmm. uh, if onshoring and reshoring is to occur in an optimized model, I really see a renaissance occurring in, in Mexico, mm. um, which uh, rail will be the, the distribution mm -hmm. mode into the United States, not the coastal port cities right. that, that uh, have, have been the drivers of the past. In association with that, you, you're, you're having an, uh, a shift in uh, community buy-in, NIMBY, mm -hmm. not in my backyard. So these large facilities that are encroaching on urban areas, there's get, becoming pushback. Mm -hmm. So I see the model kind of shifting where these large, really large DC centers, you're going to start having uh, segmented facilities into the urban core for the last mile distribution, mm -hmm. whether they be the smaller cost, cross dock transfer stations, into um, adaptive reuse centers that are actually in the urban core to, to facilitate that last mile delivery. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we, you know, we've talked a, a fair bit about the kind of repurposing, repurposing of some of the, um, you know, the malls, right? Is there a play to get some of those malls or the existing infrastructure that's maybe a different use to solve some of that last mile space? Have you seen much of that? Does this, is this a catalyst for more of that kind of development, redevelopment to happen? Well, I think given the, the, the fundamental shift in the retail sector, mm -hmm. um, A, it's, it's very expensive to do it under traditional uh, thresholds. I see retail space developing into really smaller footprints mm -hmm. with that last mile lower cost real estate to facilitate them getting the product. Consumers, I think the ultimate model is nobody leaves the store with anything. Mm -hmm. They just see what they want, and by the time they get home, it'll exactly. be at their it's on my doorstep. <laughs> it'll be at their doorstep. I'm a big fan of that model, by the way. <laughs> I, I get you. Well, most I, I think I think um, you know the Amazon effect has many different uh, uh, attributes associated yeah. with it, and that's that's one of them. Yeah. But uh, for adaptive reuse, and you brought up a great point. I mean, there was uh, probably two years ago, Amazon was putting in a play for J.C. Penney's. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and their strategy was specifically why you referenced it the way that you did. They were already centrally located mm -hmm. for optimizing last mile distribution. And I think it's a great public policy uh, conversation to have mm -hmm. to get communities engaged on this adaptive reuse as opposed to um, areas becoming blighted because of the retail nature of consumer purchasing behavior mm -hmm. has shifted. Yeah. And so I guess uh, maybe a little bit of a crystal ball here, but wh wh where do you see the next phase or what is that, that new normalized state for, I guess, industrial in general? I mean, it's, look, it's been one of the more attractive asset classes for years, right? There's, there's just a ton of capital chasing industrial. Um, I don't think we're going to become less dependent, certainly on those last mile facilities and all the infrastructure to get the products there. So is that continuing? Do you see any, any, indications or any data that you're you're tracking that would indicate a divergence from that no i don't yeah i think that continues to be the 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 trend mm -hmm. um and direction i think that uh industrial in general because of it can it can serve so many different aspects of industry other than just distribution as an asset class mm -hmm. you know another 25 year run perhaps mm -hmm. as it relates in comparison to the other asset classes within uh, commercial real estate. Yeah. But the, uh, but the onshoring and reshoring, how that pans out mm -hmm. over the next five to 10 years is really going to be the driver on the position I just took. Yeah. So if that comes in, it can only enhance that product category right. by those industries coming in, both with brand new jobs and brand new facilities and the, and, and the industry to support those facilities. Yeah, and are there, um, just as we kind of close out here, are there any data sources or data points that, that you watch that listeners can maybe pay attention to that are maybe a little bit under the radar or, or what, are the, what are the maybe the key factors that people should be paying attention to uh, to see where these trends continue? Well. Um, I'm a closet academic. <laughs> I, uh, I follow many different uh, uh, 
academic publications. Mm-hmm. Uh, Workings Institute is a good one. Um, but we, we, we pay a lot of attention to thought leadership within our organization at Avison mm-hmm. Young, and we publish it. So within our organization at uh, avisonyoung.com, mm-hmm. you can go there and, and read uh, current information on trends and uh, our understanding of market dynamics and where we believe things are going to go so organizations can make the most informed decisions. Thank you, Carl. What a great episode. You can learn more about ULI's initiatives and all of today's guests in the show notes. Thank you again to the Urban Land Institute for helping us to share highlights from the fall meeting with all of you. To learn more about the Urban Land Institute, head to uli.org. Stay tuned for the next episode in the series. And with that, we'll catch you on the next one.